Hello, and welcome to the Dolby Institute podcast. This is a show about how artists use technology to tell their stories, and I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. If you're curious to know more about the Dolby Institute, please head over to dolbyinstitute.com. There you will find information about all of our programs. You can access the entire library of episodes of this podcast, and you can sign up for our mailing list. Well, unless you have been hiding under a rock, you know that Black Panther Wakanda Forever opened this past weekend to strong reviews, great word of mouth, and big box office all around the world. So we are very excited to bring to you today a special deep dive into the sound and music of Black Panther Wakanda Forever with the movie's creative team. Joining us today are co-writer and director Ryan Kugler, composer Ludwig Gorenson, supervising sound editor and re-recording mixer Steve Bodeker, supervising sound editor Benjamin Burt, who everybody calls Benny, and re-recording mixer Brandon Proctor. If you haven't seen the movie yet, I encourage you to hit pause on this podcast and go to a theater near you and watch it. And if you have one near you, I really encourage you to see it at a Dolby Cinema. I had the privilege of seeing the film at the star-studded premiere in Hollywood at the Dolby Theater, and it was presented there in Dolby Vision and Dolby Atmos. And the filmmakers make incredible use of those technologies to tell a really spectacular story. There are some amazing surprises in this movie, which we do not discuss in this podcast, but we do talk about several scenes in quite a bit of detail. So please watch the movie before you listen to this conversation. So this episode is a little different from our normal format. I got to sit down in Los Angeles recently and talk with both Ryan and Ludwig about the movie. And then this past week, I went up north to Skywalker Sound and sat down with Steve, Benny, and Brandon to round out the conversation. So you'll be seeing parts of each of those conversations as we explore the film. So the last time I met Ryan Coogler was in the spring of 2017, and we all sat down at the Los Angeles Film Festival for an evening's conversation about the movie Creed, which he directed, which had come out a few months earlier. And we sat down with Ludwig and Steve and talked about the music and the sound design for that film. And it was a really, really special evening. I remember during the Q&A session, there was a little boy, a young man who was interested in asking Ryan about how he could potentially get a start as a career as a film director. And Ryan was just so gracious in the way he answered the question and the, the way he talked to this kid. And I, I saw that even after we were done uh, with the evening, uh, Ryan sought out the kid and, and spoke with him and with his parents. And it was just so, it's kind of amazing when somebody that's that genuinely nice succeeds in our business. So Ryan, is a, it's, it was really a great uh, pleasure to be able to come back all this time later and talk with him. Interestingly enough, at that night in Los Angeles, he told us that he had just been up all night long finishing the script and uh, which he had just turned in that day for a new picture that he was working on, this thing called Black Panther. So it's fascinating to sort of see this whole thing from that stage until now the release of the sequel. So the first Black Panther film was obviously a huge critical and commercial success and, and it became a cultural milestone. So that's where I started my conversation with Ryan. I asked him what effect the first movie had on him as an artist and a storyteller. That was the first time when I when I like, like after that film, um, I felt like uh, comfortable enough to consider myself like a professional. Before then it was, it was you know, I was convinced that the that the film I was doing was gonna be the last film I would ever do. You know, like I, I like I get I get ran out of the industry, like you know, when it when it would come off. If that makes sense. I don't know if it's like imposter syndrome or or or, or, or paranoia or or, or, or or what you want to call it. Um, but yeah, like the experience of making the first Panther. A, a lot of it, to be honest with you, a lot of it was a lot of it was Chad. You know, a lot of it was a lot of it was Nate and and Nate Moore, our producer, Kevin Feige, our producer, um, Victoria Alonzo and Lou. Uh, Diaz-Pazito, but believing in me, I like, kind of saying, "Hey, you got this. We we confident in you," and and then showing the confidence, you know. Um, but 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 Chad, more than anybody, kind of saying that he knew the movie was going was going to work and be great, you know. Before we were all on a frame, um, and what that was saying was that he trusted me. So like, I think that that 
coming come into fruition. The movie working out kind of gave me the confidence. Like, okay, maybe I'll be doing this, you know, you know, for for for, for a little bit more time than I thought. And and um, out of that, it, it gave us the confidence to 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 start Proximity Media. You know, um, it's like our, like a production company that I founded with my, my wife Zinzi Evans and my our friend Sevo Henny. Ludwig is also like a co-founder in that. Like like so so we were able to get get that started and, and make some. Make some great movies. Um, Judas and the Black Messiah being one of them, Space Jam, New Legacy being another, Homeroom in, in the nonfiction space. And we still we still rolling, you know? So like that, I, I would say like the confidence to, uh, to feel like I belonged um, in this in this space um, and, and, and the confidence to start a production company was like, the, I think the most direct effects. So for both sound and music, I was curious about building the new worlds we see in Wakanda forever. Specifically for the score, I knew composer Ludwig Göransson had tapped into African influences and instrumentation for the first film. So I asked him about his approach to exploring the major new setting in this film, the undersea civilization of Talakan, which is the home to our major new character, Namor. After reading the script, you know, it was very clear that the, Ryan, the story Ryan was telling was inspired by, by Mayan culture. And I didn't know a lot about Mayan culture, Mayan music, and I had I talked to Ryan and was like, you know, the only way to do this is to try to f really f understand it and figure out what what Mayan culture is and what Mayan music is. So I went to Mexico City and uh, and Yucatan, and I started recording um, musicians. I mean, I quickly learned that like my there. The Mayan culture and the Mayan music was it was it was forcibly erased, you know. Um, so there is no Mayan music anymore, and we don't know how it sounded like. We can never, we'll never fully know exactly what Mayan music sounded like. But is, is that partially because they had no? Did they have a notation system? Did they even write down music? This, um, if if they, if they wrote down the music, it was also erased. Like we don't know. Like all the books, all the literature, the dance, the music, the culture is, is gone, wiped from the from the earth. So I was working in Mexico City and working with musicians that were also musical archaeologists that been studying Mayan, you know, the Mayan culture and studying, finding instruments in the graves and looking at them, looking at the flutes that what they found and looking at the flute holes on on which ones were used the most you can see the fingerprints there and like so it's like okay maybe these intervals were played a lot and they can see also on the codex and on some 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 stone paintings that you know there were formations of five people playing turtle shells and then three people playing horns so you can kind of you know kind of through history and research kind of ex you know try to recreate what the sound could have been like. And so that that started on the journey of, of reimagining the sound of, 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 the, of Telecon. And a um, lot of sounds, a lot of instruments from the ocean, seashells, turtle shells, um, obviously teponusles and um, clay flutes, different type of flutes. There was one flute called the, the flute of truth, which sounded like a crazy, uh, um, like a dog whistle almost, like it's such a high pitch. And you would play that. The, the the historian was telling me that you would play that to to intimidate whoever you played it for. To to it's almost like torture because it's so loud. I couldn't be in the room when when the, he was playing it because it was it was hurting my ear so much. But you play it and then people tell the truth. That's what it's called the flute of truth. Amazing. Yeah, and you hear that in the movie. You hear it like those flutes are like any time you see that the 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 the. the that Namor's getting ready for for battle or for war, or you hear those like really high pitched flute like all in, in surround sound. Meanwhile, up at Skywalker Sound, when I was able to sit down with supervising sound editor and re-recording mixer Steve Bodeker, sound supervisor Benny Burt, and re-recording mixer Brandon Proctor, I asked them about how they went about building the sonic environments of Talicon. First of all, you want to make it convincing because especially when you start working, people are just doing this, you know, in front of a green screen or whatever. And you're like, this is insane. How is it anyone ever going to believe any of this stuff? And so you start adding as many elements that kind of make it feel like it's underwater. Um, and the cave thing, it's, it's, it looks like a set when you first start working on it, but we added like the sounds of waves up above and uh, these distant kind of 
designy sounds that David had put a bunch of in. And, you know, so at, at first you're just trying to make it believable. It was a little less about the, you know, trying to discover the instrumentation of the Mayans and more about just like trying to make you get immersed in this world. We're fortunate because since this is the second Black Panther, we already had a language kind of established for what things are supposed to sound like. But we kind of took the same approach that we took with Wakanda, which was a combination of natural sounds from Africa, birds and things like that, and high tech things. Um, it's kind of like their technology was evolved beyond the point of being high tech into this organic thing. So we did the same thing uh, with the telecon stuff and just keep feeding things into the Avid and then you get feedback. And then as they do their own internal temps, they're using the sounds that we've been creating and we can find out what's working and what's not working. But we were really lucky because like I said, we had a language already. And so things just sort of flowed pretty naturally. Steve, you mentioned the the Telecons. I want to. I want to get a large portion of this movie happens underwater, obviously, and I've got a lot of questions about specific scenes that I want to dive into you with, with you guys about. But uh, I would love just to talk for a second about that first undersea uh, sequence where they're mining and they find this, you know, new vibranium, uh, and then the first, you know, the kind of attack. Uh, when we talked with Ryan, he he almost like he actually mentioned the abyss, like the abyss was an influence. We we would, we would talk about the deep ocean as if it were deep space, and and there's a lot of academics we could we could thank for that. As filmmakers, we could thank for that. You know, James Cameron's one of them with his work in the abyss. But this this idea that uh, we know so little about what's in there and what's down there in the ocean, you know, and it, it's so it is so expansive and. and and, and also this idea of that that there could be life down there that would be almost alien to us, you know, like like um, um we wanted the film to to you know to be to be in conversation with the abyss and that and that um and that and that standpoint and we wanted to respect um how, how much you you wouldn't see down there when you get deep like like you know how how dark and, and frightening it would be and it was a specific choice for us you know um because in many ways the deep ocean you know, represented grief, you know, and, and, and um, the, the, the empty feeling or the feeling of drowning that might come to you when, when grief overwhelms you. And, and the character uh, of Namur is somebody who, who leans into that, who, who, sits, who, sits in it, who sits in his own grief and has kind of made a home there, you know, um, he's comfortable there. The, the sound, you know, when you, when you, when you go down there and, and, and how the talking will sound when they speak, when they're, under, when they're underwater, um, you know, all of those things um, that, you know, that, that, that Atmos mix really helped with. I was intrigued by this idea from Ryan that sound design could be used to explore the themes of isolation and grief, especially in the undersea world. So here's Steve Boedeker talking more about how that was accomplished. From a sound effects perspective, it was a bit of an accident because uh, I was playing around with the idea of like being able to just completely filter stuff, but almost like a DJ would where it's just like kind of thing where you're just sweeping the sound down. And so I put it across all of the effects and I was like, okay, this is pretty dope. And so what we ended up doing is you have to kind of have those filters on when you're cutting because you need to hear what it's like. Cause if you open them up, it's completely wrong. But when it's closed down, it's like, this is really cool. And we sent that off for them to have in the Avid and the feedback that we got was it was felt very claustrophobic, which is what, we were looking for. And so uh, that just became the thing throughout. It's like the effects in Foley and the Bee Gees all had their own filters, but you kind of do that. And it gave Brandon freedom to be able to play around with the dialogue and bounce things around because the effects were so low and kind of hidden away. Um, the other great accidental thing is that it left a lot of space for the score. So the music had a place because the effects were just adding this kind of weight and movement. Um, so yeah, it was, Lucky accident, I guess. Yeah. And, and in that opening scene, you have all these, like, you know, from like the breathing machines and all the other, like these tension, you know, there's a bunch of like design that you guys have in there. There was even stuff that threw, like, wait, that's not music, that's, that's design. Uh, all these like layers of elements that they were like, almost like, yeah, I don't know, I put it in there and I liked it and I tweaked it and nobody's 
called me out to <laughs> take it out. So I like, we're going to stay with it. I'm like, I love it too. I don't even know what it is. You know, like there was all these kind of elements that you had, you guys had in there that would just like add tension and, and, you know, this mood, you know, and uh, even like there's a, there's a moment before where, you know, one of the, um, I guess it's one of the telekinesis that, that go by the, you know, I don't even know what it is, you know, that goes by like camera. And, right. and I know that Shaver was asking like, hey, could you cut it off so it doesn't pan through so far? It just kind of attacks and then we hear the release of it, you know, so it just kind of comes out of nowhere. So there was these kind of these elements and, you know, motives to kind of make it feel more tense and like just mysterious, really. Yeah. Well, and the way that one evolved too is that <laughs> I was like, I don't, it shouldn't have any sound. And Benny is like, no, 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 it needs to have a sound. And then we put a sound in and then we made it bigger and then we cut it off. It was like like each step of the way, right, right. it kept changing until it became this shock moment. Right. But my initial gut was like, I wanted it to be more of a like. Did something happen? Yeah. What the right. hell was that? Yeah. Um, and so that's the way these things happen. You just kind of keep trying things and it evolves. And of course I love it and I'll take credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love that first scene where we see the, the, the telecons, you know, for the first time, cause it's so like, we don't, we don't know what this is about. And then it, what a great gift to you guys. Cause they, this is a civilization that a actually uses sound as a weapon. Right. Uh, so, and, and there's the siren song and like, can you talk about the development of that and how that came to, how that came to be? Yeah, we actually did a bunch of design stuff for that initially, and it was very musical sounding, not just for the sirens, but mostly for the uh, the sonic disruptor thing. Uh, and I think Ludwig heard that and was like, wait, this is a very musical thing. And so the sound of that sonic thing was, is that a guitar, do you know? I mean, it sounds like guitar feedback kind of deal. And then Benny put in a bunch of these sounds of the waves of it going through. And it's really the thing that anchors it to the picture because the 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 sound that Ludwig made was fantastic and it was like what what is that but having those waves of sounds going by the thrumping yeah the thrumping like, yeah. and you know that's the way these things happen they just kind of evolve over time and different people have different ideas and it, what was nice about this project and this crew is that everybody steps up and nobody has an ego it's like oh okay let's do that yeah totally for Ryan and for me sound is the most one of, the, one of the most important part of the movie. And that's something that we experienced and we found out and, and together in school. We had an incredible professor, Kenny Hall. And he had a, he was one of the guys, professors that had the only class that where the filmmaker and the composer were in the same room and talked about movies together. So we quickly kind of discovered our, our mutual love for sound and how sound affects the movies and, and it's been our on our agenda and our our, we, our dreams to make a sound for a movie that is as creates as an immersive experience as possible. So with with, with Wakanda Forever, <clears throat> we try to do that with all sounds. So that means songs, score, you know, sound design. We're all trying to blend that make that in complete immersive experience. So you can't really tell what's there. You can't tell when a song starts. You can't tell when the score starts. The score has elements from the songs. The song has elements from the score. The sound design has elements from the score and vice versa. So everything's completely connected and everything was made and created specifically for the story of the movie. And uh, and obviously the final piece of the puzzle comes when we get the mix and and you know, we've been working with Steve Odeker for a long time and like having him also thinking like, like we do and like thinking about, you know, having creative conversation about, okay, well, how does this sound and how you're mixing it? How does that work with what we're doing in the score and we're doing in the song now? And, and you know, it's, it's, it's like, it's an incredible experience to be, have such an incredible team to work with. You've talked to, about Ludwig and you brought up something that I noticed right away, which was like, I, there were often moments when I wasn't sure, like, am I hearing sound design or am I hearing score? Right, right. So can you talk about that collaboration with Ludwig and kind of got, you know, that, cause I love that yeah. when you don't, everybody's I, like I working too. together. It, it right? kind of adds more glue to everything. I feel like when it's just, you know, it's not like music on top of, you know, design. I mean, even like going into the water for the first time when you first do the sweep, there's that like weird, I don't even know what it is, you know, like that, that was the first thing I was like, is that music? Wait, I have, the music's muted, you know, like, and you know, like, no, no, I'm like, 
getting away with it. Then I'm like, great. But it's, it's, you know, there's all these like little sonic things that happen. Um, but I, a lot of it's happy accidents. I don't know what you guys did before, you know, before I was, you know, brought on to start mixing with you guys, but you know, design wise that you're sending back and forth, but you, you said that you made something for the, the sonic, you know, and then, he heard well, that Benny and, and, and David Hughes, the sound designer, and I would pass things around all the time. And so, you know, I would work on something for a few days and then David Hughes would open, he would get a new idea. And he did a, David did a ton of just crazy shit. Yeah. I have to say, it's like the stuff where you're not sure what it is. He made a lot of sort of stinger type sounds out of whale calls and things that are very appropriate for underwater. But if you listen like in the, in the underwater caves, there's sounds in there that are like, what the hell is that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and like, like Brandon was just saying, it's like the fact that we got away with it, um, <laughs> it's just amazing to me. I mean, they just were opening their arms and embracing all the stuff that we were trying. It was really cool. Yeah, I mean, sometimes there would be, would there be something specific. You're like, there's a low note on this or something that might, you know, kind of get in the way of, you know, hearing a melody or, or you know, this, the entrance of, you know, music or something like where you might want to know it is happening. You know, but it wasn't, he wasn't like, why is there tonal sounds in the design? You know, he's very, you know, collaborative in that, in that way. And one uh, of the nice things about working with Ludwig too is that <clears throat> he's writing constantly throughout the whole thing. And so uh, a lot of times his stuff is in the early tracks. And so we're able to work against it as well, which is a real treat. Because a lot of times on other shows, you know, um, you might not hear the music till you get to the final or, and it, you're suddenly you're finding that all your stuff is clashing with them or hitting at the same time. Whereas we've had time over the course of a couple of weeks or months to work against his and see where he, where he's swelling or got big hits and we can kind of tailor our stuff around his, his, well, his and music. he did the opposite too. There was a couple of times where, cause he's constantly demoing and changing the music. It's not just the music editors are awesome on this, but there's a lot of times where he's like, let me just rewrite it for that scene. Oh, now that it's, we've cut it this way or, Oh, I like that thing you're doing. Let me, what if we drop this out or, you know, he, he, he would just hear something on the mix and go like, okay, I can, let's do this with the music differently. And just, he would kind of go the other direction with you guys as well. So I think yeah, that was we, actually pretty cool. And like I was talking about having the language from the previous movie. Um, when you go to the ancestral planes in the first one, there's this tonal thing that I did that played with the music that Ludwig had done. And so we kind of brought that back. So whenever we go to the ancestral planes, we have that, but also it became almost a theme of death or the other the other life and so that tone uh comes throughout the movie and ludwig did the same thing the the themes that he had from the previous one sometimes would you know come back up and uh yeah it was it was crazy one of the things ryan had talked about with the caves is he had seen a video about people spelunking and just just sitting in the darkness and hearing the most strange sounds. And so one of the things we tried to do was just when we're in the caves is just have these weird echoes and, and things that you're like, it sounds somewhat familiar, but you have no idea what it is. It's just super weird. While we were trying to make things believable, he was always in the emotional. So like, for example, um, Namor's wings, we were going back and forth and back and forth. You know, should they sound light and authentic like they look or should they sound heavy and believable that he's actually flying and we started doing a combination of the two and at one point ryan's just like have you tried rattlesnakes yeah this might sound like a bad idea but what about rattlesnakes and we did <laughs> and so we did a combination of all of them but the rattlesnakes were the things that made it ominous and scary and yeah. made him dangerous sounding totally and, and it glued it together yeah. yeah and that was honestly like late in the game too that was kind of uh i think the last two weeks it was just an, a casual idea thrown out that changed a lot for us. Oh yeah, we went through the whole movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, Back and to there's, one. there's like rattlesnake shakers and the music, and there's all the other things that it kind of glues together again. Those pieces of the design and Namor and music, you know, it's yeah. If you listen to the score in the caves and in um, God, what is it in the death scene? There's breathing in the score. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm sitting there kind of working on the effects. I'm going like, where's that breathing? I want to try and turn the breathing yeah. up and I can't find it. And it's like, oh yeah, it's, it's on the music side. So I remember getting a note like, well, who's breathing? Is <laughs> yeah. there somebody, like, well, that's in the, uh, that's in the music. They're like, oh, like, I love maybe it. Maybe we love, <laughs> you know, but it was, it's, it, you start kind of crossing those. When you start kind of like zeroing in on certain things, you're yeah. like, oh, well maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. Let's just live with it and, you know, 
Well, in the there. beginning, in the UN scene, we kind of cut, we're cutting back and forth between action and this courtroom, basically. And <laughs> sorry, there's like a boom on one of the hits that was just there to keep the intensity up. That's mm -hmm. all. And it didn't have any justification. And it got questioned several times. And finally, Ryan's like, yeah, so what is that there for? Like, just in a role, it just keeps the intensity going. And so we tried it without it. And it's like, oh, yeah, actually put it back. So that's interesting. Yeah. I love those. I love those happy accidents. <laughs> um, I have a whole Steve, career based Steve, on them. Yeah, I was going to say, that's, like, <laughs> that's what do you think Steve's here for? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you were talking. You were talking about breathing in the the music, and one of the things that you know I realized right away was like there's a lot more songs with lyrics mm. in this movie than you're used to yeah. than you're used to hearing oh God. in a big studio tentpole movie. Tons. So, and they like to talk while those songs are playing. There's a lot of dialogue, yes. and while there's explosions, and while yeah, there's a car chase, some, and, or rockets, or maybe they mumble <laughs> during the music. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> okay, well discussed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there, there's just scenes like, you know, like the um, the Cambridge, you know, car chase, you know, a good example of like vocal lines and mul multiple vocals, you know, um, it's a husband, a wife team, that, that, that music um, and kind of amazing. But the, you know, we would, and nor first two, you get like the demo. So you get like a stereo demo of it and there's just vocals all the way across, like literally like song starts vocals and then there's dialogue. And then there's like, you know, that Riri has to, you know, originally it says on the screen, Riri mumbles to herself. So it's, it's well, literally she's like, flying a jet she's suit. a jet suit. <laughs> We're blasting, you know, this hip hop as, as loud as possible, you know, and at literally like, can we make everything as loud? And then she's going to mumble and we need to hear, of course, everything she says. Um, and and that was one of those things where I'm like, could I know it says mumbling, could but could we have her just be like really like she knows exactly what she's talking about and and have her it re recorded very clear, you know, like just, you know, command the, the situation. And they did, and that's what helped. But at first, you're like, I've got a stereo track with all and you know, and you're presenting, you know, to Marvel that day and oh, by the way, there's a new demo, so you're gonna remix that demo and and, oh, and then maybe the server crashes. Who knows? It's always, <laughs> it's a million things. And, and then like, you're like, okay, PTSD great. PTSD right now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm like- Too soon, Brandon. <laughs> uh, and, and you're like, it's just one thing after another. And you're like, okay, and do we have to hear what she's mumbling? It says, you know. So, it, you know, it, it's it's difficult to get all those words through. While and so kind of just over, we, we start learning places where we can drop, we get like the stems and like we can drop vocal lines. And then Ludwig Grass will come in and go like, oh, I think we could, I could read, you know, I could fix this music cue. He goes back to the studio and actually will give you different versions with like, you know, lyrics out in different places. I mean, literally would actually do that. So it, it cropped up in all these places that I was really not expecting, like Shuri's lab. Oh yeah. Like, it, was yeah. Like a, it was like a club. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You should have heard it before we turned it down. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, we kind of start that way, you know, like in Shuri's, you know, we, we always wanted to have a lot of life in there. You know, when she's working on something, it's kind of her space. Um, Ryan would talk that, that, you know, when the music's loud, it kind of means she doesn't want to be disrupted. She doesn't want to have any guests. She doesn't want her mom there. She doesn't want anybody around. You know, that's why the music's loud and, and playing, you know. And we'd have to keep pulling it back, of course, to, to hear, you know, the, the, just the dialogue. But, you know, it was just kind of a constant back and forth. But I, I know that, like, even Marvel would be like, what? Why are, what's going on here? Why is it music? And, and that was his- Why are there know, songs in what, Shuri's lab, Yeah, right? exactly. But, you know, and we had in the first one too, but, you know, it's, it's, she's in this place where she does not want to be, you know, bothered, you know, and that's kind of a thing that people do. You know, crank the music and I'm like, that's kind of an idea, you know, like, don't, don't come knocking on the door. I don't want to answer. Well, I even loved, uh, you know, I, I felt like there was an homage to uh, to eighty to the to the eighties movies that we grew up. Like you guys actually stopped, you know, during during when they're preparing uh, Wakanda for the, you know, Namor and his team to to come back and and lay siege to the city again. Like it's it's almost like you stop and have a music like a classic eighties mu totally. music montage. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, when they go under, when he takes her underwater, you know, that whole sequence, you know, it's it's. I mean, there are full music pieces, you know. But like that montage, they're so collaborative that that montage, what was not working was that 
we kept cutting to somewhere where you wanted to hear someone talk. And Brandon said, is there any way that we could just rearrange these sequences so that we get the sort of talking information stuff out of the way, and then we can just go full music montage? And they did. They just left, and they just shuffled a couple things around, and it changed everything. So, wait, 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 wait. You mean wait, they wait, recut wait, wait. Brandon the made picture, picture suggestion in a, order yeah. to make the sound work better? It was oh a delicate God. suggestion. <laughs> you gave him a change note. He's like, this is what I need. I had, I had this like in my back pocket where I'm like, I'm going to give him this. Should I give him this note? I just like Chopper, Chopper will take a great. <laughs> and this was a later sequence where I was just like, it's a montage. Because I think, you know, originally it was like a montage sequence and then they kept adding, you know. Well, they stuff. wanted the energy from the music and it, it, these the breaks and the gaps to, to hear the lines of dialogue just were slowing that down. Yeah, but, you know, they just, we still got all the information there and they just, you know, then I go, then I can turn the music up and we can, you know, hear the song kind of take over and stuff, you know, and um yeah, and, th and then they gave me shit for it. We did your note. <laughs> <laughs> we recut the picture yeah. the way yeah, you asked. Yeah, great. <laughs> Where you get picture changes from, you know, the sound team. Awesome. But I mean, it was, the, it was like the whole, the whole mix was like that, you know? Yeah, yeah. There was a, there was a section where the, there was a cue that wasn't really working the way that they wanted to have it work. And so it got swapped out for something else. And then Doug, our engineer said, well, that cue, maybe with that other section where you guys weren't sure about, we could put it there. Yeah, and, totally. And it was like, oh my God, this is brilliant. Yeah, and that happened like that continually. Yeah, it's true. No, no egos. Everybody was just like, yeah, good ideas are good ideas. Let's bring them to the room. You talked about the 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 Cambridge. Uh, that, that's that big chase scene, and yep. then and then really kind of the first um, confrontation on the bridge. And it's also, I think, one of the first times that we encounter the water bombs. That's right. So, can you talk a little bit about that sequence and sort of figuring out what those water bombs were going to sound like? Because it's a big element in the film. Totally. Oh, geez, <laughs> the water bombs. You know, it's we played with a bunch of ideas, and there's a lot of layers. Yeah. But there's one sound that Ryan really liked. It's the little. It's, it's got a little kind of a ping to it, and it just comes right before the explosions. And once he pointed that out, it's like everything else sort of fell into place. So you can have the water bombs in uh, <clears throat> um, in the palace with all this craziness going on. But as long as you have those ping sounds, you identified it as being those bombs. Uh, under the car, same thing. It all just sort of fell into place. Yeah, yeah. Anything to add to that, Benny? No. I, I will say that I, <laughs> I do like, love I that. I got so much stuff and it's all this I got a lot of things. <laughs> but that sequence I, I do love because you do come from that that massive, you know, car chase music, you know, it's just full on. And then literally that, that bite scene almost has very none. little music, or yeah. none, no music, you know, there's a couple little like tones, you know, raw power on power between Atuma and Okoye. Yeah. I know, which is amazing. And it's a and great fight. Scene. It is. I, I love it. And one of my favorite parts is the, uh, the, the treatment you don't did on the efforts and the dialogue with the water oh, masks, the water mask. Yeah. Um, that was a big. It deal. just makes them yeah, makes I them scary. To, and, well, I wanted and to talk really about awesome. that because Ryan brought that up specifically. You know, he talked about sort of being inspired, you know, from the comic books. And of course, in the comic books, it's not a big deal to have, you know, undersea characters wearing water masks. Right, right. But then he'd never given any thought to what that would actually mean in a real world or what that would sound like. For me, as a comic book fan, you know, like I know, like the. Um, uh, the Atlanteans in the, in the, in the in publishing, they kind of always have those those uh, uh, masks over their mouths. You know, like that's kind of like uh, you know blue skin in the mask with the water in it, so that they can breathe. And like I never thought about like what would they sound like. You know, like because in the comic book medium, you're not hearing anything. You're just reading the words. You know, um, so it was really exciting. Like it was one of those things that gives you goosebumps the first time you hear um, that like like a, 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 a human voice coming through water. You know, um, and, and through it and through a like a vibranium mask, you know, like like uh, what what would that what would that sound like? Uh, you know, it was really exciting. How did you approach this this idea of these characters wearing water masks, and what do they sound like through that, and how did that come together? Well, I approached Brandon and said, <laughs> "What are you going to do? <laughs> this one's yours, He's my like, friend." Well, I think what's Brandon, what's, what's, how are you going to figure this out? Uh, you know, I, I tried a bunch of different things, and you know, one of the first things, especially when they're they're speaking Mayan, is that Ryan, you know. I remember like even Namor when he's, you know, in his presentation to, you know, his, his people to you know, call to arms to go to war, you know, I, I did a whole thing and, and Kim Fiscato did a couple, you know, elements and I took those and like spread them around and stuff. And then I, sh I showed it to on one of those, you know, 
Friday afternoons we were showing Ryan stuff. And he's like, yeah, it's great. Can you f*** it up more? You know, and I'm like, I, I can. I have a feel we're going to come back to this, but like, absolutely, I'm happy to. It's a so, journey. Yeah, exactly. And, and that was kind of, you know, I'm all for that. I mean, I'm, you know, hearing the whole... And, and it, it became a thing, you know, how far can you go? And the water masks were the same kind of thing, you know? And then it was like that element that I added to like totally make it really screwed up. You know, I kind of took a, like a lighter version of it for the water masks and, 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 and then we had a light mask for when they're in the cave. <laughs> the silk we had like, one. Like variations of things. And then it became like, this is too complicated. You know, and I got to get it a, a little bit more like consistent, you know, and, and some people wanted it to always, you know, I was kind of, I would change it depending on, on, on emotions. You know, mm. I would actually kind of, originally the, the mask would, you know, like if they're, if they're yelling, it would be a certain way. And if they, they brought back, you know, and it, I would really think about, you know, what's going on in the scene. I don't want to get in the way of the scene as well. And was it an issue? Like, could you, once, once you established it, then you, could you back off of it? I could. Uh, yeah. I had a couple different ways. I, I, I did it. I would audio suite it, or I would actually. I also had it on sends. Um, but yeah, yeah I did, tell us a little bit about like what, what, what were you actually doing? Uh, one of uh, <laughs> what were you uh, doing? <laughs> no idea. It's uh, a good question. But I mean, I use sand toys. You know, there, there's a, an effects rack that they did, and that was one of the main. Um, I know there's a lot of different plugins in there um, that I used, and it was it was basically. To you know, originally I kind of wanted to have it sweep and have it kind of uh, you know with their you know like like an envelope with their voice, and it started getting too complicated to do that. So it was more of like it would, their voice would still affect the the sound. So it kind of have a I mean if you listen to it by itself, it just sounds like a, a it sounds ridiculous. But I wanted it to have like a, a I didn't want it to sound alien at the same time. So it was like how do you make it sound kind of this natural feel like it, like they're pushing you know the words through water you know in a mask so there's a lot of little like plugins and elements to it but um it's it's definitely like it would affect basically how it, it kind of was an envelope on it but it wasn't it wasn't opening up like a like a mutator or a flanger or something or a you know wah-wah type pedal those are all things i tried i tried different kinds of you know plugins that were emulating guitar pedals and stuff to see what i you know i almost brought guitar pedals in i mean i literally was like just because I get, what if I try, you know, but uh, at some point you have to start mixing the movie. Um, he was, it was crazy. <laughs> we would be <laughs> rolling through a scene and he'd stop and the processing would keep going and you'd hear the <laughs> slap throughout the whole <laughs> oh, really? oh, it was so nuts. And so, yeah, by itself, it was crazy. Well, and there's this thing that Kim um, came up with where she, you know, this is a different part of the, one of the parts of the elements, uh, you know, where she, she took like um, bubbles that, you know, the effects library, and then we made an IR and, and put an altiverb. And so, and the whole idea is like, I didn't want reverb when they're underwater, you know, I, it, we could use delays, but no reverbs. And so whenever, why, would, and why just because that's such a cliche or just like just, just, you wanted to make it as hard for yourself as wanted, possible yeah i just i just wanted it to, to be to really feel different you know there's reverb above and maybe there's no re you know I'll, often i would use a lot of the speakers around it because you know when you speak it actually can kind of travel so fast the uh, sound travels in water so quick but so i'm thinking about all these things but you know how do i also make it not suck um <laughs> <laughs> but you know uh so there's uh, an ir of bubbles so whenever they would speak it would go into this altiverb and and instead of reverbing it would kind of like bubble you know the, the, and and so that was one of the elements but then i would put that into like a 712 slapper so it would go through all the speakers and so it actually could bounce around the room you know so then you kind of have this Altiverb slapping around that's actually not reverb, but it's still kind of bouncing throughout the, the room. And that's one of the elements. And then there's a JRM resonant. There's all these different, you know, how can I do that? And then still try to make it like you understand what's going on. But so, then the, the happy accident thing starts happening when someone just does a breath or a grunt yes. through it and it suddenly sounds like this animalistic growl. Yeah, it started like, oh just getting- Oh my God, this is crazy. So they- We added breaths because of it. Yeah, you know, it was so like, cool. Oh, let's add another breath here. Yeah. Cause I like that- that Growly thing. Uh, you know, yeah. it kind of gives like a little gravel to their voice, you know. And I, you know, I don't know if you guys get, or how involved you guys get in with this, but obviously with a movie like Wakanda Forever, it's gonna be a global release. This yeah. is a major international phenomenon. Mm -hmm. It's opening all over the world at the same time. I, and I know you guys don't do the international language mixes right. yourselves, but how do you what do you, how, how do you, how do you tell the people who are going to end up doing well, all those foreign I language write a mixes? Document, so I write a document. 
we give them all the plugins and we give them my dialogue sessions. So they have everything that I did. All the mistakes are all there for them. Uh, I'm to sure, study I'm, I'm sure many of them are like, why in the hell would this guy do that? What, what, he could have just did it this way. I'm sure that's all over happening. Anyways, but you know, we give them the sessions. So, you know, in different languages are not going to totally work with, they're going to have to like, luckily they can make it less and more, you know, they could actually go like, let's have less effect or whatever. Um, we got away with a lot of it too, because it's Mayan. You know, there's, I, I guess there's like a million people in the world that do still speak it, but it is, you know, that's why Ryan was like, it's Mayan. It's going to be subtitled. Just go, go crazy. You know, that's amazing that you have to, I mean, obviously when you're doing something that crazy, you have to think about how are all those other mixers going to be able to totally. Yeah. I, I thought, and it's funny because at first I would only do it through like a reverb send. And then I was like, ah, oh, some of these I need to kind of, you know, audio suite. And, uh, and I would think like, I'm making it more complicated for the next person. You know, they're going to. They're not going to like this, but you know, <laughs> they're cursing there's seven you, but... languages in the movie. So, and, and they're, it's, you have to think of all, you know, sure. each region is going to deal with those languages differently and, and they may not use them. They may, you know, uh, who knows? Um, so it is kind of a, a machine. But you also can't get bogged down in that because you got to just stay in your creative space and make right. it as cool as you possibly can and then figure it out. So, or someone else is going to have to figure it out. Yeah. One of the things I like about working with Ryan is that he he likes to try and find the breaking point of things. And so he's not afraid to try weird stuff, even if it doesn't make sense. But like, you know, this, the, the water masks and the and, and Namor we're talking underwater is a perfect example of just trying weird things and let's see how far we can take it. Well, he actually says, maybe, yeah. yeah, 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 break. You want me to fuck it yeah, 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 break it. Break it. Break it. Let's find that Which point. Which is great. So you, when you come back to show him and it's, it's up. broken. You know, it's, it's you, you can, what you it, told me. It's, yeah, yeah it's, <laughs> it, it, it takes it, you know, it off your, your shoulders a little yeah. bit. You know, you're not, you don't have to walk in and feel like it's got to be perfect. You know, like, I've gone too far. What do you think? Yeah. And, and sometimes you get that, like, I haven't gone far enough. I'm like, great. And then we present it to the executives and they, <laughs> well, I mean, but they're, they're a safety net it's for true. reality. It's yeah. just like, okay, guys, really, come on. Down a little bit. Well, and as a good example, you know, when, when Namor is speaking to, you know, his people, you know, the, to, to You're talking about to kind war. of the big, the big rally sequence? The big rally sequence, mm -hmm. exactly. To, you know, and, and I, I had made his, you know, uh, Ryan played a song where it's um, Barry White and Elder Bard singing together on a, on a um, Herbie Hancock song. And, and uh, he's like, yeah, like, there's something here. I want to have this, this kind of, this feel, I'm like... Okay, cool. Uh, <laughs> it, it, like, I'm just trying to like, I mean, I, I, I kind of love that kind of idea. Like, how do you, you know, always thought of that, you know, didn't, I did not accomplish that at all. But, <laughs> but, but it, it's still kind of in my head, you know what I mean? Like, I, I, I just love stuff like that. But, you know, so when we messed up the dialogues, I mean, to, to, if you spoke mine, you wouldn't be able to understand what he's saying. Yeah. And, and, and like, and for like victorious if they're like i'm not feeling him now i feel like i've i'm i'm too too far removed from you know to know you know the the actor and his 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 yeah, namor you know and his his energy you know it sounds cool cuz you know ryan wanted like godlike figure especially when he's underwater and, and almost like on this like megaphone type thing um but you know it did take you a little away from maybe the acting at that part and so um so yeah we we had to you know, pull back but you know it's it's just one of those things of you know trying to push as far as you can and breaking it you know well, somebody's going to catch you in the safety yeah you're net. lucky because you have a safety net you know That's and so true. you can't go too far because someone's going to just go hey by the way yeah, but then the safety net wants you to like fix it in like <laughs> five to ten minutes. Yeah, yeah, in front of everyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. we'll just sit here while you totally change it. <laughs> Talk to me about the uh, the Ironheart suit. Oh Jesus! <laughs> <laughs> Have we said that on every? Yeah. Wow, everybody's taking a drink on this. Uh, yeah, Which one what is this? <laughs> Mark one or Mark two? Oh yeah. What uh, was it? A particular design challenge, or did it take a? Well, what, yeah, was I mean, it just a. In, in the Cambridge <laughs> scene, it was it's 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 her Mark one. And um, it's it's kind of scrapped together, you know, yeah. re made it out of a variety of machines that she's pulled from. And so, you know, the note we kept getting from Ryan was that it should be like combustion based. And so we kind of- More kept, like low tech kind of or yeah. mechanical kind um, of, yeah. Not refined. Uh, and so we kept trying, he didn't necessarily want it to be like a, a rocket, um, but we kept trying a bunch of different stuff. I think we'd tried mopeds, 
um, drones, lawnmowers, lawnmowers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really. <laughs> we tried everything, and uh, it ended up being a combination of um, some drones, mopeds, and some other things that we. Threw yeah, what in was there what with was, a little bit of rocket? What was a little bit tough about it too is that you're cutting from the suit to them chasing with the motorcycle mm. and the car. And so if it sounds too much like those, you don't really too get many a sense doing of the same thing dif- at the yeah. same differentiation. Time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So by having these layers that Benny is talking about, um, depending on what is coming before you or after, you can change it. So you can make it a little bit more rocket-based so that when you cut to the motorcycle, it sounds different. Um, but if you're not cutting to the motorcycle, then you can have a little bit more of a combustion-type engine. So it. It went through a lot of iterations, and it, it, you know, if you were to, look, if you were to look at the Pro Tools session with it, you'd be like, oh my god, there's like six different things going on here, and so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah. and then obviously the second suit that gets built, you know, in Wakanda, um, yeah. has a very different, a little bit more high tech, um, a little bit more thrust, and uh, you can add some Wakanda tech t- tech to it because it it was made in Shuri's lab. Wait, and- wait, wait, wait. What is it? What is the sound of Wakanda tech? Oh, Steve. come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> Highly advanced. Doesn't sound annoying. It doesn't sound Based annoying. Based in reality. It, it's, so when we were working on the first one, um, and David Hughes and I were doing some design, what we ended up doing as an experiment is I told him, and I'll talk about like the ships, like the, uh, the RTF is a really good example. I told David, I said, start making some stuff using African sounds, African birds, African instruments, African anything. And I'm going to use like synthesizer-y, techy type sounds. And then we'll trade. And so you start combining those things and you get these sounds that have like a little bit of a bird kind of a thing, a little bit of a, a percussion type of thing, and then some synthesizer beeps. So it's like a or whatever. Jazz. Um, <laughs> jazz. <laughs> so but what was nuts is on the first one, uh, there was one sound that Nate, the producer, really liked for the RTF flying by. It was just this kind of this moaning sound. And uh, he's like, yeah, what is that sound? <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah, that's that thing that I made. And David was there. And he's like, no, that's the thing that I made. And it turns <laughs> out that this bird sound that he had slowed down to use as a sweetener and the synth sound that I had made were both almost identical and they were interchangeable. And so we would use them differently in different places. And um, but that's sort of what the Wakanda thing is. It's like African-based. Their their technology is so advanced that it's beyond high tech, and it's got to have some soul to it. Uh, that was the approach that we took with that, and it's the approach that we took with the the Telecon sounds as well. Talk to me about dynamic range um, in the mix, because uh, you know obviously there's some huge set pieces. I want to talk about the you know the epic finale battle as well. But even in the finale battle, you got kind of two things going on at one. You've got the huge battle taking place on the on the the, the ship. And then you've got Namor and Shuri kind of having a, a like a one-on-one fight as well. So it, it seems like you had a lot of opportunities to play with very, very big. And then there are also a lot of moments when you guys are leaning into the emotion. I feel like we almost go completely silent. Oh yeah. I mean I mean, and just the moments where we're just like, it's only wind or at the very end where we're just, you know, actually that's kind of on both, you know, it's kind of a bookended, you know, when we do that wind only situation. But uh, there are, I mean, this movie is pretty dynamic, especially for a Marvel movie. You know, there's a lot of quiet moments. There's a lot of delicate dialogue scenes where it's just, you know, two people talking and you're like trying to stay out of the way. Um, but you know, and then like you said, the, the the fight scene in the end, you've got, you know, a score going across, kind of gluing things together. But you have, you know, Namor and Shuri, you know, Black Panther, um, fighting, and then the, the moments of the flashbacks with you know her mom and 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 so you kind of have these moments where you ha- you can take a break. You know, it does create more of an impact too when you have you know these you know a score piece or a, a synth come in and actually. You know, it has his space and a place to come in, um, but uh, or the the fight scene on the bridge you know, in in Cambridge. You know, like that. There's no music there. It's 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 funny. It's such a quiet fight scene. You know, um, but it it. I mean, some of those sounds that you guys have, especially with their, you know, raw fighting, is is kind of amazing. Well, the thing is, the movie it's not just sonically dynamic; it's emotionally very dynamic. Yeah, it's true and intense. And we kept talking about sitting in the mix and it's like could you, you guys 
how many emotions have we gone through today? You know, not just with the movie, but also you have the anxiety of trying to get it to work. Uh, we're all picking on each other and like making jokes. So we're laughing our asses off a lot of the time. In fact, I think we got mocked for it. It's like, what is going on in here? Yeah, you guys are yeah, just laughing all the time. Um, <laughs> Some and tears. Then, and too. then you have these, <laughs> these funeral scenes that are really intense. And we had talked about how Ludwig was cool with us doing stuff musically. Like the first funeral scene, I, I had put these sort of booms in, in sync with the music that just were there to kind of have this heaviness. Um, and the music in the next funeral scene was different, but the booms were the same. And I kind of added a little bit of weight to it. So it's, it's the dynamics were written into it and we just kind of were basically following the lead. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. There's also some great <clears throat> some great scenes like uh, uh, with Ramonda, you know, relieving Akoya of her duties. It's just a really uh, it's one of that's my favorite amazing. scenes of the movie. And it like, really, it's, it's an amazing because you don't expect it. No, right? and you just, uh, I just want to stay out of the way. So let's just you know we strip everything away and yeah. Just, one of my favorite things for things like that is is letting the reverb define the space. And you know, so that Brent, just to, Brandon just and to, I kind of like reverb a little. <laughs> just to, t to talk about that, so that's sort of in the that's in, in the throne room, yes, right. So and it's obviously this big. Yeah, we're we're, we're in Wakanda. It's a big sort of feels like a kind of a metallic a metallic sort of totally. space. Yeah. So yeah, you, when you say get out of the way, what does that mean? You want to feel the acting. <laughs> yes, feel the acting. In fact, actually, that's that's a really good example for one that. Um, Brandon was saying, I want to hear a little bit of the foley for the the neck necklace that she was wearing and for the moves movement of that. And it's a great example of where hearing something that should be quiet, hearing it loud, makes you feel how quiet it actually is. And, and it's the only foley you hear. Yeah. It's There's only a, it's a room hear. full of people, but you don't hear any yeah, of them. The tension. Yeah. You only hear, you know, her foley, you know, which is like just makes her feel like more singled out, I think. You know, it's just that you know but it's interesting it's always it's also like it's to me that's a great sound design i love when sound design gives you the subjective experience that a character's feeling it's sort right. of like in a really emotional moment like that you know when you're like she's getting called out and yeah. in, in, in front of everybody and kind of humiliated right right there's something like you know not that i've had a lot of experiences like that <laughs> but like you start to like you know your your you're perspective aware of your perspective yeah. shifts and yeah. you you, you you hear things very strangely. Totally. Yeah. You, you, every moment you're like, Oh my God, they're hearing that shuffle. Oh, they heard that thing or whatever it is. The same thing is true for the UN sequence. Um, we tried when the queen comes walking through the door. You're talking, this is the sequence at the earlier, very the beginning, beginning of the yeah. movie. Yeah. Um, the queen comes walking through the door and we had Foley and everything and, and the space had been defined and it was really nice and it was clean. And Brandon took out the sound, the production sound of what was really happening. And we were both kind of like, I don't know, man, it doesn't, it doesn't work. And you needed to have that. She was commanding the room and that intensity and all of the movement and all of the stuff of people coming through there. Um, and it just, it was a very different experience. And the same thing with the Foley, you know, she's sitting there and you're hearing nothing but her impatient, angry tapping on the desk. It's those are the little things that they let us do that are fun. Well, uh, gentlemen, you, you're aware you're on the Dolby podcast. So, um, it, it the the underwater sequences are such a gift in Atmos. The way you use the overheads to give the audience the experience of being underwater. But uh, talk to me about that. About other choice Atmos moments in the film for people to listen to. Yeah. Well, I mean, right away. I mean, <clears throat> when you're. It, I mean, you can use every speaker right away when you're underwater. So that's kind of a, a great, I mean, and, and, and get away with it, you know, and, and on purpose. Um, but also, you know, the music's all through, you know, at most of the whole thing. Um, you know, just, just the idea that like, um, I would listen to each, like stem to figure out like, do I want this in the mains? Do I want it in Atmos? And I'd have different setups for, for each, you know, like different setups I could try and I would just listen sonically, what is it doing? Spatially, what is it doing? Will it work when you glue it all back together? Cause then you, you can immediately have that point source uh, for your surrounds, you know what I mean? So it's not an array anymore. So like some things just work differently and better. Um, and then just having the, the subs everywhere. But you, you immediately, you know, can go through each thing, but also in the music, I mean, in the, the water, you have that, that opportunity to just like literally do whatever you want, you know, and, and it, 
it, it literally allows you to do it, you know, in an easy way. And for the underwater stuff, it's nice because you can put it in all the speakers. But since we were doing the filtering, you're still giving space for the music and space for dialogue and space for things. Um, so that was like one of the first things that we started thinking about challenge wise is like just making this underwater convincing and, and uh, immersive. And so, of course, having all those speakers is like the best way to do it. Yeah, totally. The whole scene when we're we're going into Talacan for the first time, just kind of a bunch of water stuff to kind of really just feel like we're moving through these, uh, I call them jet streams. I don't know what they're actually called, but just these the pipelines of water that carry them through. That carry them through to, yeah. to get down there. Yeah, yeah. So that, it was, it was, that was an amazing effect. And so it was just, you know, the opportunity to kind of put water movement everywhere and really get the sense that we're moving through, going deeper and deeper. And, and to pull music off the screen without completely being in the surrounds. You can just kind of like pull it off a little bit and it still feels more immersive, but you're, you're still connected to the screen, you know? Uh, and it gives us a, a place for all the other sounds, all the, you know, effects. Any other sequences that you guys want to talk about before we wrap up? It, it, the overall is just it's such a dynamic movie emotionally that, um, you know, I suppose if we were going to wrap up, I would wrap up with the wrap up of the movie. Um, and it's really interesting because as I was working on the very end and not to give anything away or whatever, it just felt so emotional and you wanted to just be with Shuri. And so we started just peeling away the layers, you know, there's the, the ocean waves and there's the wind and there's the dialogue and you start peeling those things away <clears throat> until you get just the emotional breathing and the wind and the wind is a tie in from the beginning of the movie from over the credits, which is emotional right there. And then the queen talks about finding T'Challa in the wind. And then in the end, she finds him in the wind. And uh, yeah, that even during the premiere, I was just like, oh, still God. get goosebumps. Just yeah, about I know, it. Ryan, you killed me. You the, killed me, man. The first time I saw it was, well, I guess I hadn't seen the movie yet, but Ryan had come up here to do the editorial assembly and play back the whole movie that they had shot. It was like four hours and 20 minutes or something. But I was watching from the projection booth waiting for the end to wrap and I was just, I couldn't hear it, but I could see the whole, the ending on, you know, play out. And I, it was, I got emotional and you know, goosebumps then just watching it. It's just, it's, uh, yeah, I love the way the movie wraps up. You, you talked about it. I think you both talked about it as bookends. And we talk on this podcast a lot about the first 10 minutes of the movie mm -hmm. and how you set that's how you world build. You, you tell the audience the movie that they're going to see. Mm -hmm. You set the expectations for how you're going to tell the story. And I feel like in this movie, more so than any, pretty much any other movie, there was a very specific task that had to be accomplished in that first 10 minutes, which is how are we going to deal with the absence of Chadwick? Right. And I, the solution that you guys hit on, I thought was so beautiful and so elegant. After Chadwick passed, you know, it was it was such a shock for everyone, and and obviously, the music in the first movie, the talking drums and all the themes and all the sounds was so tied to his character. So, I kind of had to completely rethink what the score was going to be for this movie, and also think about how we could how we how would we be able to use those elements from the first movie, the talking drum or or his theme, like in a way where it worked, because those sounds have such an impact. They're so, they're so important. And as soon as you hear a talk of them, you, you'll, you'll start thinking about certain things from the first movie and, third, and Tachala. What I, what I hope audiences take away from it is, A, how much we love Chad, you know, um, how much we missed him. For us, Chadwick and T'Challa are, are, are linked because that was how we, that was a circumstance by which we got to meet this great guy, you know, about, about it was through bringing this character in this world to, to, to life. So for us, not for everybody else maybe, but for us, it's, it's, it's always gonna be, it's always gonna be a link there that um, we can't ignore. Um, so I hope all the answers understand like, you know, how we felt about this guy, hey, but in a more expansive sense, this concept of just because somebody is dead, it doesn't mean that they're gone. You know, like, like how, how they feel him and feel what he was about because his effect is still there. I think it's going, I think it's going, going to be around forever, you know. When the Marvel logo comes up, which is usually a pretty bombastic moment, yeah. talk about that and just like the audience, like 
you guys, it was such a great emotional moment and just, I thought just the perfect way to handle it and get us into Every time we would get a new turnover of the movie and there wouldn't be music there, I was like, I don't know, that's a, someone f***ed up because no, there's no way we're, they're going to let us do this. It was empty for a long time. It yeah. was empty for a long, long time. And um, we kept saying, like, this is so powerful, you know? How are, how are we going to convince them to let us do it? It was Ryan. That's what he wanted. And um, it was a big challenge to make sure that, that you have to be respectful. But it's a Marvel movie, so you also have to have fun. And the movie is written that way. It's designed that way. Um, we just followed through with the vision that Ryan kind of set out for us, but trying to maintain that sort of respectful appreciation for what's at the root of the story. Yeah, and I mean, if you just think about like Ryan having to write this movie when he did rewrite it, yeah. you know, and rewrite it with the, the, that grief, you know. I mean, it's, that's a, a lot. To, to go through and I, you see it all through the film you know um, and and they kept it that way which is great too I mean which is really an honor you know to, for Chadwick but you know it's it's just so much you know um, yeah I, I kind of can't imagine really you know losing a friend like that and then having to to then write a film <laughs> a right. Marvel film too that's supposed to be you sure, know an sure. action event you know film and then and then and then make you know, and I think just to make that emotional journey through this movie. That's like that. one of the things I liked about this movie is that it's, for me, I see this whole movie as uh, uh, not only the characters, but the actors grieving the loss of their friend and, and the, both, you know, Chadwick and T'Challa. And you, you can kind of see it bleed throughout the whole movie. And I, I really love that. Yeah, it, it definitely gives it its real edge, you know. It's grounded, incredibly grounded, you know, for that reason. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a lot of people have to deal with losing someone. And so to be respectful of what Ryan had created and what the actors had all created, and also to the experiences that everyone in the audience is going to have or has had, um, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a big challenge. And you guys succeeded. I mean, I just, you know, you know, it was a big challenge to, because you have to deal with it at the very beginning of the movie. Um, and then, but it is a Marvel movie and you gotta, yeah. you gotta, you gotta Still deliver delivered. on that. And the movie is able to play and exist in both of those spaces yeah. so well. Yeah. Thanks. The movie's coming out this weekend. It's going to be big. Um, and thank you. It's, it was, it's always good to sit down with you guys yeah, yeah. and to talk about this stuff. And it's great to be back at the ranch. Yeah. Um, I know. Me so too. <laughs> th thank you guys for, for coming in today and talking with us about Black Panther Wakanda forever. Yeah. Thank you. Anytime. Very much. Kind of forever. <laughs> Thank you once again to Ryan, Ludwig, Steve, Brandon, and Benny for joining us today to talk about Black Panther Wakanda forever. And thank you especially to our good friends at Marvel, Disney, and Skywalker Sound for helping put these interviews together. Uh, as you can imagine, it takes a lot of coordination, especially for a movie that hasn't been released yet. So we're very grateful to our partners for making that happen. So as I mentioned up top, the movie is playing right now in theaters. And if you have a chance to go see it in a Dolby Cinema, please do because it is a truly spectacular experience. Before we go, please make sure you're subscribed to us, the Dolby Institute podcast. Uh, we have some really great episodes coming up. We're into the fall movie season and we're gonna be moving into our Oscars coverage pretty soon. So there's gonna be a lot of stuff coming up that you will not wanna miss. You can find links to our show on all the major podcasting platforms in our show notes, or you can simply search for Dolby wherever you get your podcasts. Until we see you again, thank you for joining us. This has been the Dolby Institute podcast. I'm your host, Glenn Kaiser. Our producer and editor is Michael Coleman. Our executive producers are Amanda Schneider and Jack Ferry with production support by Taylor Hines. And our production coordinator is Sonny Chen. Thank you again for listening.